Now, with your Bibles open today, the book of Acts chapter number 6, I'm going to be uh, reading quite a few verses of Scripture here, and then we want to uh, call your attention to a subject that I believe is a very needed uh, subject in this hour. Acts chapter number 6, we'll begin at verse number 1. The Bible said, And in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and uh, Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. The Bible said whom uh, they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now, our fathers, we come to you, we thank you for the reading of the word of God, And I pray you'll help us during this message, Lord, to use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me just start by saying like this. I'm going to preach on this subject today, the office of a deacon, the office of a deacon. Now, I've done some studying on this, and I want to say something right off at at the start of the message. If you do not believe that the deacon originated in Acts chapter number six, we're not going to get excited about that. We're not going to have a parting of the ways over that, okay? Some believe that. Some believe that's not where they started. I don't know. I don't know. But I would say this to you, that I believe that's probably where they started. And I do believe this. There's a great principle here in the Bible anyway for service. All right? Now, let me just say the word deacon is found two times in the Word of God. It's found in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, verse number 10, and also 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 13. Let me say the word deacons with an S on the end of it is found in Philippians chapter 1 verse 1 and also in 1 Timothy 3 and 8 and also in verse number 12. So really a total of five times the word deacon or deacons is found in the word of God. Now when I mention this subject, many people draw a uh, friction between the deacons and the preacher. And let me just say that that is not the way that it ought to be. I want you to understand that. Deacons do have their place in the Bible, and the preacher has his place in the Bible, and everybody should follow the rules that God has laid down for them. Now, here in the book of Acts, when they when they did everything right, the Bible said that the disciples multiplied, that the Word of God increased. Now, uh, one writer that I read from said that possibly the early church at this time, uh, that this church had 25,000 members. I don't know. That would be a large church. And even if these were deacons or they were not deacons, these seven men that were that were put over the congregation to meet the material, the physical needs of the people, that wasn't really all that many compared to 25,000 people if you had seven men doing that job. Now, let me just say this to you, that the pastor's job, the, the pastor's main jobs in the church is to give himself to the ministry of the Word of God. That's the preaching of the Bible and to prayer. That's the main two jobs of the preacher. Now, I believe that no deacon's job is ever to be over the pastor, but we're going to deal with that in just a few minutes. So I want to preach on this subject today, the office of a deacon. The office of a deacon. Number one, I want to say this. First of all, what is a deacon? What is a deacon? Well, if you study the word deacon, you'll find the word deacon means a servant. You'll find it means a minister. You'll find it means one who carries out orders of another. That's what a deacon is. Amen. And so we find that the deacon is placed in the church uh, to be helped, excuse me, to be a help 
to the pastor. The deacon is not to be a hindrance to the pastor. But I believe that the pastor and the deacons, now I believe the pastor, the Bible said he has the oversight of the church in First Peter chapter number 5. So this uh, myth really that the deacons do all the business and the pastor does all the preaching, well, that's not Bible. That's not, that's not the way it is. The preacher is to be the overseer. He's the pastor. The deacon is not to keep the preacher in line. That's not his job. But the deacons here were to work, and, 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 and they did here even in, in, in Acts, they worked to provide the needs of the material end of the people. Now, I, I don't believe it hurts a deacon to check up on the sick folk. Now listen, I've got nothing wrong with the pastor, and I'm not going to get into all this, but if the pastor, you know, if he visits sick folk, that's fine. But I, I hope the pastors and preachers will remember, I'm not telling you how to do your job, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. The main job of a preacher is not to visit the sick. Uh, the main job of a preacher is to pray and to preach the Word of God. Now, I do believe this. I believe we need some maturity in our members of our churches today. I believe the members of the church expect too much sometimes of their pastor. Uh, the members of the church have to have, and by the way, it's good to have a preacher there when something goes wrong in your life. And I thank God for the preachers that I've had down through the years that have uh, been there for me. But I also realize that if, if I'm sick and a preacher can't be there for me, I'm certainly not going to get mad and leave the church over it. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's not maturity. Amen. So what is a deacon? A deacon is a servant. A deacon is to carry out the orders of the pastor to help where the pastor deems necessary and, and what the pastor needs. Amen. Acts chapter 6, verse 2, the Bible said, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples uh, unto them, the Bible said, and, uh, and said... It is not reason that we should leave the Word of God and serve tables. Now, that tells me uh, that the deacon's job is to serve tables. Now, that would be just like a waiter in a restaurant. You, you go into a restaurant, you sit down, and a man comes, Hi, my name's uh, Harry, and I'm your waiter today. Well, what can I get for you? All right, he's your servant. You may send him back for extra ketchup. You may send him back for extra bread. You may send him back for a refill on tea, whatever. But he's your waiter. He's your servant. And that's what a deacon is. He's a servant to the church. Amen. That's what a deacon is. He's a servant to the church. Many, many men start out as deacons and end up being preachers. God calls them to preach, and that's okay too. But let me say that the deacons, the office of a deacon is to be a good servant. Amen. By the way, this applies to preachers and everybody. If you do not learn to serve well, you will not learn to succeed well. You must serve well in order to be pleasing unto God. Even as a young preacher, if you're a young man, you better learn how to serve first, amen, before you have a place of authority, amen. I never forget this. I, I tell the story sometimes. But years ago, I went down to, uh, to uh, uh, a camp meeting. And uh, I went down there, and I, I thought, boy, I was, you know, something else. I mean, I was invited to come to set up a table to promote my ministry, and I, I thought, man, I'm, I'm in high cotton here. Well, that afternoon, the pastor of that uh, camp meeting and the leader of that camp meeting came by me, and uh, we were standing there, me and my brother, and he said, hey, boys, he said, uh, there's some trash on the floor right here. He said, would you pick that trash up and put it in that can over there? And I got to be honest about it. it. It just in the flesh, it didn't sit well with me. And I'm, I'm thinking, man, I, I'm a preacher and they call me down here. Now I'm getting dressed. But you know, the Holy Spirit straightened me out on that thing. And the Holy Ghost taught me a valuable lesson that afternoon. I went and put that trash over in the trash can and learned to be a servant. Amen. And let me say this, some good things and great things happened before that great preacher passed away. Some great things happened uh, between me and him. A friendship w was made and, 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 and somewhat, and it was, it, was, it was a great, great thing. Amen. And so, but what I'm saying is this, I learned to be a servant. And if you can't learn early in your ministry to be a servant, and if you can't learn early in the church world to be a servant, see, people today want to be recognized. And uh, be honest with you, recognition is not the main thing in church, but it's, it's how pleasing are you to the Lord. So now a deacon is a servant. Now, that, that's, that's just what he is. That's what God put him there for. All right. So now let me say, number two, that deacons are church appointed. I want you to understand that. Now let me just go back here. A deacon is not called of God. I want you to understand that. They're not called. In other words, it's a gift to be a deacon, but it's a, it's a choice by the church. It's a choice by the church to put 
a man on the deacon board to serve the pastor, okay? Now, the preacher's called. He's got a calling. Deacons are not called. They're church appointed. And so that doesn't make them any less than anybody else, but they just need to be mindful of their place that they're appointed by the church, all right? So they're appointed by the church, all right? Now we see again in Acts chapter 6, verse number 3, the Bible said, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over, uh, the Bible said, uh, uh, this business. And, and basically what was happening in the early church was that the business was outgrowing. The pastors couldn't keep up with everything. And the disciples, the apostles couldn't keep up with everything. And so you have a church that large. They, they, people were being neglected, you see. And so uh, the deacons help, help with that. If, if that's, you know. And so here's the thing about a deacon. A deacon is appointed by the church. Now he's, I believe he's ordained by the church. The Bible said when they laid their hands on him, they prayed on him. I believe, I believe that by the way. But these, these, these men in Acts chapter number six were also approved by the apostles. I believe the deacons ought to be pastor approved. Amen. I believe that if the, if, if you start to appoint a man and, uh, and, and, and the pastor says, no, that, that fellow wouldn't make a good deacon. He's got a good reason. Uh, then you don't appoint that man. So we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Now, a deacon is a good thing. A deacon's not a bad thing. You, you show me a godly deacon that helps his pastor and does what he's supposed to do. And I'll show you a church that will grow for the glory of God. When the pastor and the deacons get on the same page and they, and they do what uh, that they're supposed to do, then the Bible said here that the Word of God increased and the Word will and, and the church will go. You know, the one reason today, and, and I, I don't mean to be negative, I really don't, but one reason today our churches are not growing like they ought to be growing is we don't have things in line like we ought to have it. Amen? We've either got a pastor who's a dictator and he's he's being a lord over God's heritage and he's just, he's just ruling over everybody. Uh, you got that situation. Or you've got a, a pastor who don't take a strong stand and the deacons run everything. Well, now both of those situations are out of line. You need a pastor who's the overseer and you need the deacons who does the material in under the direction of the pastor. That's the key to it. They do it under the direction of of the pastor. No deacon should ever be a burden to his pastor. Amen. No pastor should ever be a lord over his deacons. Amen. By the way, the, the deacons are not equal with the pastor. The pastor's word should be the final word because that's God put him as the overseer. And I'm trying to make this subject as plain as I can because you don't hear this preached on very much in our churches today. And I'm going to say some things in a few minutes that need to be said about deacons and things. So a deacon is church appointed. Now, Amen. I, I, I believe that. Amen. Now, let me just let me just go ahead and say this, and then I'm going to get into s some other areas. Uh, the deacon uh, is always in the, the male sense of the word, is a deacon, is a man. In the Bible, it's applied every time that word deacon is used, it's referring to a man. I want to say, God does not have women. Now, listen to what I'm saying. Listen to my wording. God does not have women on a deacon board. Now, man may have them on there, but God does not. God knows there's no such thing as a deaconess. I want you to understand that. God knows that. There's no such thing. So if you women are listening to me, and I cover a large area on radio, and if you're at what, what the world calls a deaconess, you're out of line. You're, you're, you're not in line with what Paul said in the book of Timothy about the woman to keep silence in the, or, or the, or I suffer not a woman rather to usurp authority over the man. I, I'm going to go ahead and touch something else here and, and I believe I'm within the realms of the Bible to say this, and I'm, I'm going to say it here. Uh, women are not to be in the place of leadership on a pulpit committee searching for a pastor. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If I was, a, uh, and, and of course I am an evangelist, and, but if a, if a pulpit committee called me and a woman called me, I probably wouldn't even call her back. I'm going to be honest with you. That indicates to me the church is in a very big mess. When you put a woman, you say, well, you know, preacher, times have changed. Now, I was thinking about this yesterday. Now, you would say to me, now, preacher, times have changed. You've got to get with it. I want, I want to ask you a question. I realize and I'm going to agree with you that times have changed. I'm going to agree with you that we live in an hour where we try to make men and women the same. I agree with that. I, I, agree, I agree that the times have changed. Now, watch my wording here. But I do not agree with you that the Bible has changed. The Bible has never changed. And do you think as great as God is? Now listen, you believe that God created the heaven and the earth, right? You believe God makes the sun rise and makes it set, right? 
You believe God made the sun to rule the day and the moon to rule the night, right? You believe God sent the showers and the rain, right? You believe all that, right? Okay. You're going to tell me that a God in heaven that with that much knowledge does not know that times would change? If God wanted to change with the times, He would have wrote a new modernistic Bible and dropped it out of heaven. God has not wrote a new Bible. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible will never change. No matter how men, men, men have changed their minds about deacons, men have changed their minds about preachers, men have changed their minds about marriage, men have changed their minds about morals, men have changed their minds about liquor and beer and abortion. And but God has never changed His mind. Now the Supreme Court can make any laws they want to. It doesn't. Uh, it does not. It does not change anything. Amen. I, I was. I was talking uh, just yesterday. Uh, with, with, with a young man. He brought a good point out, and I'm going to use it right here. You know, sometimes we in America, we think that Christianity is an American religion and the Bible's an American book. That's not true. The Bible is everybody's book across the world, whatever nation you're in. The, uh, uh, Christianity is not just an American religion. And let me say that some other countries have not changed like America has. Brother, America's going down a road that she ought not be going down. And just because America changes, it does not mean the Bible changes. I want you to understand that before you get mad at me now. Amen. And, and I'm preaching to you the King James Bible. I'm preaching to you what has been, what is now, and what will be. And a hundred years from now, this Bible will still be here. If, if, if the rapture of the New Testament church has not occurred, hundred years from now, the Bible will still be here. And brother, men will still, I won't be, because I'd be 155 years old. I won't live that long, I don't think. But uh, I'd love to live that long and preach, just to, just to you know, just to, I'd love to, but uh, God won't let me do that. But here's the thing about it. Uh, these subjects need to be preached in our day. I, I think we're living in a day when probably our young pastors have never heard a message on a proper deacon. I think we're living in a day when our deacons have probably never heard a, a good Bible message. Now, let me say something about that. I know that in deacon or, ordinations and uh, preacher ordinations, we, we drag these scriptures out like, like we kind of do, like the Christmas story at Christmas. Listen, this ought to be preached more than just, as an, just at an ordination service. There's a lot here about the deacon, and I'm going to get into it now. Number three, and I'll be on this point for the rest of my message today. I'll be on number three. Number three, I'm going to deal with the qualifications of a deacon. They're only found in one place in the Bible, and they're found in the book of, um, in the, well, really, the book of, uh, they're found two places, in the book of Acts and in the book of, uh, uh, the book of First uh, Timothy. But I want to deal with something here in the book of Acts for just a few minutes to, as, as I start this uh, uh, about how God laid this out. Now, when, when, when God put down, let me just look at Acts 6, 3. The Bible said, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. Now, I don't believe that means that every church ought to have seven deacons. Seven is the number of perfection. And God was just saying here, if you want it to work right, you know, do it right. I, I believe that's what God was saying. Now, if, if you feel like that you have to have seven deacons, that's, that's all right with me. i got no problem with that. Amen. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. Now, watch this. Of honest report. Now, first of all, uh, well, let me just read the verse. Of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, I'm going to break these three things down in the book of Acts. Number one. We talk about their spotlessness. All right, verse number three says, of honest report. Now, if any man's going to serve in the church, and I believe not just for the deacon, but I believe in any office, he ought to have an honest report. Amen. God help us that we've got dishonest people in our churches. Brother, did you know that a statistic came out not long ago? It was an astounding statistic. It came out not long ago that 30% of churches in America, that people were stealing money, from the treasury. Ladies and gentlemen, that is an absolute shame. And we ought to preach on dishonesty. I mean, listen, we ought to name it in the pulpit and say, hey, we shouldn't be dishonest. You know, there are people right now, they're stealing church money to pay their car payment and to pay their house payment. You know why? Because self has taken over in most of our churches. We could not function today uh, with as much power as the early church did for this simple reason. There's so much carnality in our churches today. I'm talking carnality. Men must be of honest. I, I believe a deacon, 
He ought to pay his bills. Amen. I don't think he ought to owe the carpenter, the mechanic, the funeral home, or the hospital. Amen. I think a deacon ought to pay his bills. Amen. He ought to be spotless. He ought to be a man that you can't put your hands on and say, well, that man's done this wrong. That man's done that wrong. I mean, that's what's given deacons a bad name. And it's not fair to the good godly de- By the way, we do have, we do have some good godly deacons. And I'll probably get a letter this week from a deacon in a church, probably. Matter of fact, I welcome a letter from a deacon in a church this week. And, and we'll probably get a letter from a deacon that says, I'm a deacon in the church. And I encourage you. Thank God that you are. I'm glad you're a good deacon. But be a good deacon. Have, have, your, have your life in order. That deals with the physical, basically. Having your life in order, your spotlessness. Listen, people today want to live in sin and serve the Savior. Are you listening to me? People want to live in sin and serve the Savior. What we ought to do is repent of the sin, amen, and then, amen, report to the Savior for service. We ought to repent and report, amen. Instead of uh, sinning and serving, we ought to repent and report. We ought ought to repent uh, uh, of our sin and then report for service and say, God, now I'm clean Use me. Amen. That's the way it ought to be done. Now, another thing these qualifications dealt with, it dealt with the spirituality. Now, every church ought to have spiritual deacons. The deacon, you know, people get the idea, well, the pastor, he's the spiritual man, and the deacons can be carnal and chew their tobacco and so they, you know, smoke the cigarettes and cuss a little bit and, and flirt with other women on the job and all that stuff. Whoa, 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 whoa. Where'd you get that idea? The deacon is to be spiritual too. If Acts chapter number 6 is where the deacons came from, and I'm preaching that it is, now if you don't agree with that, it's okay. You don't have to get mad at me about it. But, but let me say this to you. Then what did he say? He said, seven men, he said, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost. He said, now preacher, I, I, just, I just don't know if I believe all that, uh, you know, being full of the Holy Ghost. Well, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. What that means is this. That don't mean that they're going to speak in a language that nobody understands. It don't mean that they're going to shout and run through the church for three hours. It don't mean that. But being filled with the Holy Ghost is simply this. By the way, every believer ought to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Every believer. Every believer. And the first man they chose was Stephen here, and they said he was full of the Holy Ghost. Now, when you get saved, you get God. He comes to live in you. The question is, has God got all of you? Are you filled with the Holy Ghost? Let, let, me, let, me, let me give you a good way you can know you're filled. Does God control your time? Does God control your talents? Does God control your treasury, your money? Does God control your temper? Uh-oh. Does God control your testimony? Uh-oh. Does God control your tongue? Uh-oh. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of some of these things. Amen. I need to work on them. Amen. 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 I tell you, listen, when you're spirit filled, these things God will control. And the deacon ought to be filled. And this is why you have so much trouble in the churches. I believe this. Uh, I believe there are good pastors. I believe they pray. I believe they witness. I believe they love the Lord. And then they get a bunch of carnal deacons. That are, that are not spiritual, and therefore we have problems. The deacons are more interested in the... What, what, what one commentary writer said this. He said he had heard of men turning down a other job in the church and saying, no, I want to be a deacon. I want to be over the material things, you know. Well, you know what it is? What it is, they don't want to be honest about it. Amen? There's nothing worse than a deacon that's a crook, right? Amen. And you don't want that. By the way, there's nothing worse than a pastor that's that way too. Amen. You you got some preachers that are not honest. You got some preachers that are not honest with the church. You got some and they ought to come clean. By the way, God's not called you preachers just to live off the church and do nothing. The church is not a welfare base. Amen. If they're paying you a salary, you'd better be praying and studying, sir. Are you going to stand before God for that? Amen. There is a judgment seat that is coming. And it's not going to be a picnic, a paycheck, a parsonage, a play day, a popularity, and, and all this kind of stuff. It's going to be standing before God for the gold, silver, and precious stones or the wood, hay, and the stubble. Now, you know, wood looks pretty when you paint it, don't it? You make some pretty things out of wood, but you put it in the fire, wood will burn too. And so I don't want my works to be burned on judgment day. Amen. So God is saying to the deacon here, I want the deacon to be a spiritual man. 
By the way, any deacon that is not a spiritual man, you ought to resign the deacon board until you get spiritual. Amen. If you've got sin in your life, you ought to get it out. It's sad we have to preach this stuff, but we do. Now, the third qualification that was laid down here in the book of Acts, it dealt, first of all, with their spotlessness. It dealt, secondly, with the spiritual. Thirdly, it dealt with their skill. He said, and wisdom. Any deacon that's going to be on the deacon board needs to be a man of wisdom. You don't need a a 20-year-old boy on the deacon board. You don't need that. Amen, young man. Amen. I say boy, young man. And when you get 55, everybody's a boy too, you know. But but what I'm saying to you is this, my friend. You need some people that are wisdom to know how to handle things in the church. You need to know how to handle your business. Church has become so involved. It's not like it was years ago. I'm not a pastor now. It's our time I'm preaching this to you. And uh, I pastored some in my early years. But church has changed even to the past. And I know that the last pastor that I had, uh, even even the legal side of it, it's got so now that you have to cover all your base. You run a bus ministry, you better have the legal angle covered. If you uh, if you do anything with children, you better have the legal angle covered now. You better make sure you got insurance on your church. Listen, fifty years ago, we have to worry about this kind of stuff, but you do now. You do now because times are changing. There's a crowd that don't love your church. And there's a crowd that would do anything they could to destroy your local assembly, you see. But now the deacons need to have wisdom. I, I want a deacon board that's got some wisdom about them. I want a deacon board that thinks out things and don't move on the spare of the moment. Amen. I mean, listen, that's why business meetings are dangerous. When you have a business meeting and you open it up to the public and you say, well, has anybody got any new business tonight? And you open it up to the entire church. Well, brother, you don't know what anybody's going to bring up that way. Amen. Now, if you do business that way, I'm not mad at you. But but you better be careful. I believe the business of the church, and this, is a, this I guess, is more personal, but I believe it ought to be done between the pastor and the deacons, and, and then it ought to be recommended and then voted on by the congregation. And, and the deacons ought to be men that you choose, that the church has choose, but they need to be men of qualification. So now, now we move into 1 Timothy chapter number uh, 3, and we're going to deal in verse 8 with the qualifications of the deacon. Now I want you to look at this. Likewise. Now that likewise means that all the, that really the qualifications are similar to the qualifications that he laid down to the uh, to the to the pastor is going to be for the deacon. Now, likewise, must the deacons be grave, and uh, that means dignified. That means reverence. In other words, they fear God. Uh, a deacon's not a church boss. You see, some deacons don't fear the Lord, but a deacon, you're to be grave. Amen. You're to be uh, mature. You're to be a mature man. All right, not double-tongued. How about that one? Amen. Now, deacons, you're not to be double-tongued. You're not to say one thing to please this crowd, another thing to please that crowd. By the way, our preachers could learn that too. Amen. We, we shouldn't be double-tongued in the pulpit. We should not preach to please people. Now, I'm not ugly in my preaching. I'm not mean in my preaching. I don't feel that I am. I've been accused of that over the years. But I want to say that I really believe I'm trying to help people. And... and uh, I love every one of you, but I'm not to be double-tongued. I'm to say what the truth is. And if you don't like the truth, well, then you can pray to the Lord about that and get the Lord to help you. All right, not double-tongued. Now, listen. All right, not given to much wine. Now, they don't mean that you can take any wine. It just means don't be a drunkard. Amen? Don't do anything that's going to empower your judgment. That's what it's talking about right there. That's why he's saying that. I mean, because we know that wine is wrong. Strong drink is uh, uh, raging. Amen. Uh, wine is a mocker and strong drink is raging. Who, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But wine uh, it affects your, your thought and your walk and your talk. And so he's wanting the deacons to be on a good thing. To, to do the business of God, you got to have a good mind about you. And I'll just throw this in. I believe that means your mind ought not be in pornography either. Your mind ought not be on uh, uh, some uh, 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 the ladies in the church. Amen. I mean, listen, I know how men do. I know how some men talk. And I'm going to tell you, the deacon ought to be upstanding. He ought to be right. His mind ought to be right. Amen. He ought to think right. Amen. He ought to think right. Not double-tongued. All right. And then the Bible said, not given to much wine. Now, he said, not greedy of filthy lucre. The deacon shouldn't do anything from money. Now, some deacons feel like that the church treasury is theirs. I want to say this to all of you, especially to you who are treasurers in your church, especially to you who keep the money. That money's not your money. And you're, you're not to be uh, uh, the watchdog over it in the sense of, well, I, we're not going to spend this because I'm going to make sure. No, you're to either do what the pastor and the leaders of the church ask you to do, 
And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then you need to resign as the treasurer, okay? I mean, the treasurer's job is not somebody where the church money is yours. And, and more times than not, it's some deacon that's the church treasurer. And so he feels that the church money is his money. Well, that's not his money. That's not your money. When you give your money to a local congregation, I'm a Baptist. Us Baptists are congregational. We believe that uh, the majority rules in the church, okay, when we're voting on uh, building a building or we're voting on uh, new pews for the church or new offering plates or new instruments for the church. And so if you believe that, then, then the offerings that come in there ought to be, ought to be run in an in a, in a, in a, um, orderly fashion. That's what I'm trying to say. Amen. So uh, filthy lucre. Deacon's not to be greedy. A filthy lucre. All right. Now, verse number 9 says it's holding the mystery of the faith in a good conscience. Now, what the deacon is to do is that that's concerning the gospel. And he's to have a good conscience. He's to hold the gospel in a good conscience. Amen. In other words, he's to, uh, he's to give the gospel, I believe, to people. And I believe deacons ought to be soul winners, just like preachers. I believe deacons ought to witness to people. I believe deacons ought to be men that, that uh, try to get people saved. Amen. Amen. That's right. And they ought to hold that. And, and by the way, I believe the deacon ought to be grounded in the doctrines of the Bible. I believe he ought to know the Bible. Amen. I believe that. So the deacon here, we see that. All right. Now, verse number uh, uh, 10 the Bible says, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. Now, let me back up here and say let these also first be proved. Now, here's the thing. Here's where a lot of churches make a big mistake. And I, I really believe we're making this mistake in, in the pastors too. We're sticking men in the place of leadership that have no business. There. And I'm going to say something. And on the surface, it is blunt. Okay, but I'm I'm a hundred percent right about what I'm going to say. Now you listen to it. If a man cannot teach, don't put him in a teaching job. If a lady cannot play the piano, don't put her playing. If a man cannot work a bus route, don't put him on it. If a man can't be a good deacon, don't put him there. If a young preacher can't pastor a church, don't recommend him there. We got people in office today. Listen. Our churches are being run so poorly that if we were a secular business, we'd be out of business for tomorrow. I'm going to give you an illustration. Would you want a doctor that didn't know how to doctor? But yet you sit under a Sunday school teacher that is not skilled in the Word of God. Now you say, well, now, preacher, if we don't put old Ralph in, we're, we're, we're going to offend some people. That's our problem right there. we got too much family in these churches running, and a, a church should never be family-owned and operated. It don't belong. By the way, the church don't belong to the pastor and his family. Where have we ever got the idea that the pastor's son should be the next pastor? Now, wait a minute. That might work in some churches. Don't get mad at me. But the church is not a kingship where we pass the authority off to the next man. I know some of y'all ain't liking this. It's all right. But I believe if we're a congregationalist, I believe the church ought to pray together. By the way, by the way, you remember the book of Acts when Paul and Barnabas were sent out as missionaries from that church. Do you all remember that? Do you remember that the Bible said that they, while they prayed and fasted, and the, and the Holy Ghost spoke to who? He spoke to all of them. I mean, they all knew that Barnabas and Paul were to be missionaries. I believe if we're living close enough to God, I don't believe there'll be a conflict between the pastor and the deacons. I believe that God will speak to the pastor, and I believe God will speak to the deacons. By the way, pastor, if you've got something in your church that you're getting ready to bring up that you feel like it's going to be a real problem, let me tell you what to do. Why don't you pray 30 days for your deacon board before you ever bring it up? Pray for them. Call them all out by name. Lord, help Sam. Help John, help Henry, help Joe, help Frank. How many ever deacons you got, Lord? And for 30 days, call their name out. And then when you go in there, everything will be all right. Amen. We, 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 if everybody will pray and get on the same page, I mean prayer. Prayer is so important in the church. And so the deacon, my friend, is to be proved first. The deacon is to go through a trial period. I believe that. I believe it. And by the way, by the way, if he can't, if he cannot meet those qualifications during a trial period, then let him don't don't have him. I, I'd rather see a church have no deacons 
than to have deacons that are unqualified, okay? Now, I want to say something to you. Now, I don't want to be ugly, but God does not call... Excuse me, let me back up and get my wording right. God does not qualify the call. I want you to understand that. Some people some people say, oh, God qualifies the call. No, He does not. God calls the qualified. God calls the man that is qualified. God doesn't qualify the call. God doesn't say, okay, I'll call you. You don't meet all these qualifications, but I'm going to call you anyway because I like you. Now, I've got some Greek for you on that. Hogwash and pickle juice. That's what I say about it. Amen. Now, I love you. I love how many of y'all love me. How many of you deacons love me? I'm helping you. Amen. How many of you preachers love me? Not so many, and I love you. Hey, preacher, your church will be blessed when you have good deacons. And by the way, you deacons ought to be wise in things. You ought to know when to take care of the pastor. And, 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 and by the way, the, those that rule well are worthy of double honor. That means if you've got a good pastor and you're paying him $15 an hour, he's worth 30 Amen. That's what the Bible said. And you ought to know, I mean, Christmas time, you ought to know how to take care of your pastor and his wife. You ought to know how to take care of them uh, other times during the year. And you, ought to, you, ought to, you don't hear this preached a lot, but that's right. Now, the deacon. Amen, the deacon. Amen, all right, so we're looking at the deacon. Amen, let these also first be proved. He said, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. That goes back again to that spotless, not having a mark on them, not having something that somebody can come up and say, well, you got a deacon on that deacon board and he don't live right. You see, today, our churches, you don't even hear this preached in churches much anymore. You know why? People don't care how they live. People take the attitude of, I'm going to live how I live. Ain't none of nobody's business how I live. And you don't really care how many people's dying and going to hell because of the way you're living. Did you know the Bible said ye are the light of the world? Did you know that more people's going to go to hell because of carnal Christians? You say, oh, our carnal saints. There's no such thing as a carnal Christian, but carnal saints. Did, did you know that you, you may say, well, 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 they shouldn't follow me. Well, they do. People look at you. Even the weak saints in the church are looking to the deacons and the preacher for leadership. God help a preacher that is not a leader. I was born a leader. Now, sometimes as a leader, that does not mean that you have to do things hateful. That don't mean you have to do things in the flesh. But sometimes as a leader, you have to do things that you don't want to do. You have to address situations that you don't want to address here at Gospel Broadcasting. And I've been here for 22 years in the ministry. I've been here really a long time. Amen. Long, long time. Amen. Uh, almost, almost. Well, well, yeah, uh, 22, and 22, going on 22 and a half years now. Amen. Not quite there, but I've been here a long time. And we've had a lot of people work for us down through the years. Now, I'll be the first to admit that I've made some mistakes. Okay. I'm going to be the first to admit that. But there are some situations, and I mean, there is some serious situations that I've had to address in 22 years here in the ministry. And I'm going to say this, if you, you cannot live carnal and worldly and, and, and expect to work at gospel broadcasting, amen. Uh, well, I mean, listen, friend, uh, there's some things that I've had to address over the years. And I don't make no apology for addressing some things over the years. But let me say this to you, through it all, God's been good to me. And just because I take a stand, some of the very people that I've had to take a stand against love me the best right now. They sure do. And brother, people will not fault you sometimes, a pastor, for taking leadership and deacons in the church. You say, oh, but I can't do that. That's my sister Sally's uh, nephew Joe's cousin's Fred's uh, 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 cousin. I can't take a stand against them. Let me tell you something, brother. You will learn this. It's not family first. It's Jesus first and then family. Listen, blood to me is not thicker than water. Water is type of the Word of God. And when it comes to a situation, I take the Bible over any family. Amen. Uh, you saw the deacon. He must be blameless. Now, uh, verse 11 says, Even so, I'm, I'm in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 11. Even so, must their wives. Now, here's the deacon's wives. By the way, if you're a deacon, if you're a servant in the church, then your wife must meet these qualifications or, she don't, or you don't. By the way, if you're a preacher or a deacon, did you know your wife can hinder you from your ministry? Now, I was 40 years old. I'd been preaching for 20, I believe it was, I counted up the other day. I'm going to say it was uh, 20, almost 23 years before I got married, I was a preacher. And I want to thank God for my wife publicly. I want to say she's the best thing that's ever happened to me. I thank God for, did you know, though, that your wife can affect what you do in the ministry? That's why you need to keep a good marriage. 
That's why you and your wife need to be on the same page. And I thank God that me and my wife are. And God, uh, uh, be with us because anything could happen in our marriage over the years. We, we, the devil's going to fight both of us and until 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 the grave. Amen. But you know what? If you if you'll keep a good marriage. God will help you. Now, some of you preachers say, well, that just ain't fire. I can't help what my wife did, so I'm going to do it anyway. Well, now, wait a minute. You're going against the Bible. In anything against the Bible, you don't prosper. Verse 11 says, even so, must their wives be grave, not slanderers. That means you don't talk about people and degrade people and put them down. Sober. That means you wives ought to be calm and have some reasoning about you, amen, and understand, faithful in all things. Did you know I know some women, their husbands come to church and they never come? Well, ma'am, that disqualifies your husband from being a deacon or a preacher if if you're not faithful. I know, I mean, there's preacher's wives that don't even go to church with them, amen. Did you know that disqualifies you? From being a man of God, if you if my wife suddenly decided that she wasn't going to church anymore, we'd have a problem. We'd have a big problem, amen. Because I mean, listen, you got to be faithful, ladies, in all things. Hell, I just can't do this, and I just can't. It's 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 odd, lady. You do anything you want to do till it comes to the church stuff, amen. Now I think it's time we just quit being so uh, easy minded where women are concerned and, and a lot of times preachers preach on the home and they do it half compromising because they're afraid to say anything about the ladies. Ladies, there's a great place for you in the Bible. You're not second place to a man either. My wife is my helper. She's my completor. She is my help that is meat for me. She's not a help mate. I hear people say that all the time. She's not a help mate. Those words don't go together. She's not a, a mate is a pair of shoes. She's not a help mate. My wife is my help that is meat for me. Now, that's Bible. It's what Genesis said. Amen. I mean, God performed a surgery on Adam. He uh, produced a spouse. Amen. And, uh, and well, first of all, he, he put him to sleep, performed a surgery and produced a spouse. Amen. And so, but the woman was to help Adam. The woman was to be, my wife is to be, Deacon, your wife is to be a help to you. Thank God for good women. We got some out there, good ladies. Thank God for you good ladies that are a good help to your husbands. Thank God for you. Wonderful you are. Thank you for helping your husbands. Amen. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Amen. God bless you. Now, amen. All right, let's see. Not standard sober. He said, faith, all right, verse number 12. Now, it says, let the deacons be the husband of one wife. Now, again, that does not mean one at a time. I want you to understand that. It don't mean one wife at a time. I want you to understand that. Now, again, this is the same qualification as the preacher. Deacons are to have one wife. That's it. By the way, I, I just addressed this because I didn't address it up there. Uh, if, if you're a deacon on the deacon board and your wife's been married twice, you're still disqualified. Because the Bible said you're to be blameless. Jesus only has one bride. It's the same thing for the preacher. Preacher, if you've been married more than once, you're disqualified from preaching. Now, you might can do something else. And there's some good men in that situation. And and what they ought to do is find them a church and find them a job that they can do. And again, God does not qualify the call. God calls the qualified. Now, I'm saying it in love. I'm not, I'm not, can I tell you that, that there are some good people that have been divorced and remarried? There's good people and good friends of mine, but they cannot fill the pulpit. They cannot fill the deacon board. And, and even if their wife has been married twice, it disqualifies them because they're not blameless. You see, but I, I, I know preachers that will put them on there. You, you, well, well they, they've not been married twice, so they can fulfill it. No, their home's out of order. And he's going to deal with that right here in the next verse. He's going to deal with that, that the home being out of order. All right, the husband one wife. Here it is. R- well, the same verse, ruling their children and their own house well. Now, let me say, if you've got a divorce on you, that means that you've not always been a good ruler of your house. You see, a divorce, my friend, is a mark on you. you the Bible said a wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, listen, that don't mean God hates you. But, you, but you're not blameless. You've got a mark that's going to go with you to your grave. It's going to go with you. You can't help that. There's nothing you can do to get rid of that. Now, you say, well, preacher, God's unfair. No, God's righteous. God's holy. You must remember, even in the day of grace, God is still a holy God. 
He's still a holy God. Now, some folks say, well, I don't think you ought to bear down and spend time on this husband of one wife thing. Well, you know what? I think we should. And I'm not going to throw slurs about it. Now, I used to preach mean about it. I'm not going to do that. But I think that this thing has gotten out of hand in, in fundamentalism. There was a time in fundamentalism when I was a boy growing up, you didn't even you didn't do anything hardly in a church if you was if you was divorced or married. I, I do believe there are things you can do. But preaching and being a deacon is not one of them. And and, and I, I know men today that are rebellious and, and they'll say, Well, I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway. You show me one that's been double married that's preaching that God's really a blessing. I'm going to give you something what a man gave me one time, and I'm going to give you this. It's a very wise statement the man made. There's a difference in God using a man and man using a man. Now, I'm going to leave it right there, and I'm going to move on. So if you're mad at me, you have no right to be. Amen. By the way, the deacon's to rule his own children well. You're not to give your children everything they want. Amen. Cut your children loose and let them run all through the church. And, and brother, that disqualifies you as a preacher or a deacon. I want you to understand that. We need, uh, us fundamentalists need to get out of all this psychology about raising our children. Well, we want to sit down and talk to them. You don't talk to a child and reason with a child like you do an adult. You do what the Bible says. Amen. You bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Amen. That's your responsibility. By the way, I'm going to say this to the parents. It is not the public school's responsibility to raise your children. It's not not even the Christian school. It's your responsibility to raise you. It's not the preacher's job and the Sunday school teacher's job and the youth director's job to raise your children. It is your job. God gave them to you. Children are in heritage of the Lord. Who inherited them? The youth director didn't inherit your children. You did. Raise your children right. And if you're a deacon or a preacher, by the way, some folks say, well, I understand why preachers' kids turn out the way they did. They say they they see their daddy go through so much. That's hogwash. You young people, if you love the Lord, you ought to learn to endure hardships. And yes, there's going to be some hardships for the preacher. And yes, if he's a godly deacon, there's going to be some hardships for the deacon. I happen to believe Stephen was the first deacon. And you know what happened to him? He didn't get a great reward and he wasn't on television. He got stoned for the gospel's sake. Amen. Now let me move on real quick like. Verse number uh, 13 says, for they, that, that, for they that have used the office of a deacon well, purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the deal. The judgment seat is coming. Have you used the office of a deacon well? You're not to please yourself or the church or the pastor. Have you pleased God in your service as being a deacon means a servant? Have you pleased the Lord? Have you done things that's right? You purchased yourself a good degree. You purchased boldness in the faith of God. You grow. You know, you may not always be a deacon. When, when it talks about being boldness in the, in, in, in the faith, one fellow associated this with growing in the Lord. God may promote you to being a preacher one day. God may promote you to something else one day. You, you make a good servant. You're not going to go unrewarded. God's in heaven. God's watching. You say, man, I'm a deacon. I've been a good deacon, and no doubt you have. I've served the pastor, and no doubt you have. And I've done this, and I've done that. Let me tell you something. Yes, but you can't beat a good servant. You can't beat a good servant. You know what? You know, Mary and Martha, and I never thought about this sitting right here, but you know, Martha went in, and she started trying to serve, and she was cumbered about a lot of things, and boy, she got all sideways and been out of shape. And Mary was at Jesus' feet. You know what Mary was? She was, a ty- she was serving the Lord by hearing his word. Now you see, sometimes there are different kinds of service. Some folk may think you ain't doing anything. If you pray in the secret place, and God give us some praying deacons, wouldn't that be good? That God would give us some praying deacons like old Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, that on Saturday night some of you deacons would pray for your pastor? Oh, wouldn't that be good? Some of you deacons meet on Saturday night, uh, my friend, uh, just secretly in your homes, amen, privately. You don't even have to meet together, but pray that God would fill your pastor with the Holy Ghost on Sunday. Oh my, what about that? Wouldn't that be good? Wouldn't it be good if we could get back to that and we had good deacons and good pastors and they worked together and we had churches with the power and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples, the Bible said they increased. They already had 25,000, but more people was getting saved. And the Bible said a great company of the priests believed. Did you know a Jewish priest was hard to win to God? And they still are today. Did you know what that's saying? When you got the church in order, great things will happen. 
when you got the pastor where he needs to be and the deacons where they need to be and the assistant pastors where they need to be and, and this pastor and that, that, that department, when everything's clicking just right, you're going to reach some people for God that you had no idea you'd ever reach. Amen. You, uh, listen, a great company of them priests believed. How, how many people could, what could you do in your community if your whole church would just get right with God? I mean, if you just go in Sunday and meet with the pastor and say, look, we just want to get right with God. Everybody needs to get right. I mean, the preacher get right. The deacons get right. The Sunday school teachers get right. Everybody needs to get right with God. The choir needs to get right. Amen. Throw your sin down. Lay it down. Walk for God. What a blessing. And the Bible said they saw an increase, and you can too. Now I'm going to give an invitation like this. I'm going to pray. If you're a deacon, and you're using the office of a deacon well, I'm going to ask God to bless you. But if you're not, how about you getting right with the Lord right now? You may have to go back to your pastor. You may even have to resign the deacon board if you're on it wrongfully. And uh, how about you preachers praying that God would give you some godly deacons? Amen. Now, if anybody's listening and you're not saved, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to be saved. Father, those that have used the office of a deacon well, would you bless them? And Lord, those that are not right with you, would you help them? And help me. I hope I preach this in love and in the Spirit. And use me. In Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Save the sinner that's nearest tale. In Jesus' name, amen.